you know, where is this going? What's happening in the future? And what, what, what's the assumption that comes in here? So with that in mind, we're going to pick this up here. And I want to talk to you tonight about the Daniel, the Daniel 9 part, because Daniel 9, the assumption that we have in a premillennial view is this, that Daniel 9 predicts the death of Jesus the Messiah. After the 62 weeks, the anointed one will be cut off. And Daniel 9 then indicates that final seven-year period is the Great Tribulation period. And we assume that that's all moved now into the future and that Daniel is talking about something in the future, especially at the end of time. So the question becomes, if these assumptions are not true, what do we do with the premillennial system? Now, I'm personally skeptical of systems to start with because I don't think theology fits systema systematically. But what are, we, what, what are we to do if the Bible doesn't tell us that there is a time frame on the, on the Great Tribulation? If the Bible says there, and we can't prove biblically that there's seven years of Great Tribulation, what's that do to us? How do we react to that? What does that mean for us when we look at Matthew 4 and, and the book of Revelation? And then it also brings in the question, the rapture is a separate event where God comes and takes the church out and then he waits until the end of that seven-year period or whatever it is to come back and, and return to earth. So these, if these assumptions are not true, then this is what we struggle with. What's the timing and what's our question with all this? So here's Daniel 9. And assumption A is that there's 70 weeks of Daniel 9 and they're all referencing the future. The second part of this assumption is that the coming Messiah could only be Jesus who would appear at the end of the 70 weeks. Now, for that to happen, the math has to work out. The chronology of the years has to fit. And I have seen so many mental gymnastics of trying to make this fit, and I'm just going to show you the timeline tonight, and you can say whether it fits or not. So that's B, that Jesus was there. And then the final part is that Daniel 9-1, that one week is the Great Tribulation period seven years of a great tribulation. And we then lay that over top of the book of Matthew and over the top of the book of Revelation. And we start in Revelation 4 with the rapture. And then we run those, you know, five, Revelation 5, Revelation 6, Revelation, all the way through what's happening during those seven years of great tribulation. That all goes out the window, though, if Daniel 9 doesn't support that. Because we, we're, we're basing that all on an assumption that's not provable. So here's, here's Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, and I put the date of when this, this king started to take over. It was 538, 539 is when he came into his kingdom. He was of a median descent, and he had been appointed king over the Babylonian Empire. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, who was now 82 years old, we know this from the chronology of studying the book of Daniel, came to understand from the sacred books that according to the, to the word of the Lord disclosed to the prophet Jeremiah, the years for fulfilling the desolation of Jerusalem were 70. Now, Daniel was taken into captivity, into Babylon, and he's coming now in, nine, in chapter 9 and verse 1. It's coming now to the 70-year time frame. He's looking back, and he's reading Jeremiah, and he's like, holy crap, those 70 years are almost up, or they're up now. I'm 82 years old. And we know that he was taken as a young man. He was taken, obviously, you're running here. If the 70 years are up, he was 12 when he was taken, which fits the chronology. Remember the story of him and Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go, you know, the whole thing of how they did their thing. They were kids. He was 12. So he's studying the 70. And in verse three, so I turned my attention to the Lord God to implore him by prayer and requests with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord, my God, and I began to confess. And what did he confess? Well, he's reading Jeremiah and he's praying that he would understand if the 70 prophesied in Jeremiah was true. And if that 70 years was true, then he knew it was time for the Israelites or for the tribes of Judah. This was the Southern, you know, branch of them, Judah and Benjamin. They were going to go back to Jerusalem. So this is the context of the 70. Make sure you understand in Daniel 9, the 70 came from Jeremiah's prophecy. That's where it started. 
And Daniel said simply to God, I want to understand it. So Daniel goes into captivity in 605 BC. That's when he's taken at 12 years old into Babylon. And that's when the word of Jeremiah came out. And the, the word he was reading in Jeremiah 29, and I'll show you that in just a minute, he's reading about the restoration and the promised restoration that God had for the nation. Now, there's some evidence, I shared it earlier with Coke, that God took this seven of a Sabbath rest. Every seven years, Israel was commanded to not farm. They had to leave all the land blank so it could rest. And God would provide in the sixth year all they needed for the seventh year. Israel didn't trust God. We know that they screwed that up a lot. And so what did they do? They did not let the, the land rest. So every seventh year they farmed. And there's some evidence in the Old Testament that God took them in exile because they broke the Sabbath rules. And they were in exile for, every, for one year for every year of seven that they didn't follow the law. So that would have meant how many years? 490 years they'd screwed this thing up. So now we come and he's reading Jeremiah 29 and he's praying for understanding. And lo and behold, God sends Gabriel. Now, where do we find Gabriel in the New Testament? The nativity story, right? The Christmas story. Gabriel's the one that goes to Zechariah, the priest, and, and he's the kind of the messenger that gives the news to Mary. This is Gabriel. Here he is in the Old Testament. By the way, there's another archangel in Daniel called Michael. Michael and Gabriel both show up in the book of Daniel. So God sends Gabriel, and Gabriel comes, and, and this is what Daniel is reading. So I want, to, want you to see this, and then we're going to come back and see what Gabriel has to say about it. So this is Jeremiah. Chapter 25. Is, then we'll go to 29 as well. This whole area will become a desolate wasteland. These nations will be subject to the king of Babylon for 70 years. He's talking about Judah, the southern tribes. He says, I'm going to lay it waste. And true, for that time that, that Judah was in Babylon, nothing happened there. Remember, when Nehemiah got back, it was a wasteland. It just, I mean, and it's almost like God said, okay, you didn't leave it sit every seventh year. Now it's going to sit long enough, and it's going to get its rest. But when the 70 years are over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation for their sins, and I will make the land of Babylon an everlasting ruin. I, the Lord, affirm it. I will bring on that land everything I said I would. I will bring on it everything that is written in this book, everything that Jeremiah has prophesied. For many nations and great kings will make slaves of the king of Babylon and his nation too. I will repay them for all I have done. Where is current Babylon located? Iran. Iran or Iraq? Okay. Iran, not Iraq. It's Iran. So what's happening in that whole area right now? From this prophecy, Jeremiah basically said, I'm gonna, God says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it an everlasting ruin. Nothing ever good will come out of there. And what are we trying to do today? We're trying to make a nuclear peace treaty with, with that part of the world. It's like I mean, we have no concept of how bad this is. So this is Jeremiah. This is what Daniel's reading. But keep in mind the 70. That's the critical part. So Daniel reads that, and he comes now in, in verses 4 through 19 of Daniel, and he says, I'm going to confess how broken we are and how we broke all the covenants. All of Israel has broken your law and turned away from not obeying you. Well, by not obeying you. We talked about that last week, right? We talked about the fact that here we are, we're in this setting. Israel broke the covenants. God is not obligated to fulfill his promises because they broke them. You've poured out all this judgment on us. You've, you know, we've sinned. And then in, in four, he says, I prayed to the Lord, my God, and made confession. Oh, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Who does he keep that covenant with? Those who love him. Those who love him. See, there's, that was the condition. And if you didn't love him and keep his commandments, what happened? The covenant was broken. God was not obligated to fulfill his part of the covenant because the covenant was broken at that point. And this is what, this is what Daniel's doing. So he spends all the time from, from verse 4 through 19 confessing this. And in the middle of that confession, while I was still speaking and praying, confessing my sin, the sin of the people of Israel, presenting my request, 
While I was still praying, verse 21, the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen previously in a vision, this shows up earlier in Daniel, was approaching me in my state of extreme weariness around the time of the evening offering. So Daniel is so intent on this. Now keep in mind, he's 82 years old. He knows the 70 years are probably up because he can count back when he came, All right? So he knows it's close and he is pouring out, he's fasting, he's in sackcloth. I mean, he is just, he's spent and Gabriel shows up and he's worn out. And Gabriel says this, Daniel, I have now come to impart understanding. That was the prayer, right? Now, remember, what did Daniel want to understand? Is the 70 years up? Tell me about the 70 years, Gabriel. That's what I want to know. And at the beginning of your request, a message went out. This is kind of interesting about how things work in the, in the heavenly realm. A message went out at the beginning of your request, and I've come to convey it to you. For you have a, you are great value in God's sight. Here's the message and understand the vision. Now, the context is 70s, 70 years. Daniel says, am I going back to Jerusalem? What's happening? Where's this going? So understand where the 70 comes from. So here's Gabriel. 70, 70 weeks is the English that translation I used here. It's actually in Hebrew, 77s have been determined concerning your people and your holy city. And then here's the list. To put an end to rebellion, to bring sin to completion, to atone for iniquity, to bring in perpetual righteousness, to seal up the prophetic vision, and to anoint a most holy place. Okay, this is restoration language. But Daniel, it's not 70 years. It's 70 Sabbath years, 70 times 7, which would be a total of 490 years. Now, the context, Daniel's asking for understanding about 70, and Gabriel comes and says, there's not 70, there's 490. Okay? So I got 490 years here. So the 490 years in Daniel's vision by Gabriel is broken into three segments. There's a segment of 49 years, which Dan, which Gabriel says are seven sevens. There's a period of 434 years, which are 62 sevens. And there's a period of one, one week of years, which is seven years, which is a Sabbath year. That's seven total years for a Sabbath year. This is, remember that context. There's three different parts to it. Okay, so here, here we go as we get through them. So Gabriel says, know and understand from the issuing of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one now, just mark somewhere in your brain, we're going to talk about anointed one. Do you understand why people have come to believe this is Jesus? Right? Meshua, Meshach, the Messiah. This is the, the Hebrew term for it, right? I will tell you in second temple literature, of which Daniel was written, prior to Jesus being here, anointed one never referred to him. It's post New Testament context that people saw anointed one referring to Jesus. The Jews would have never thought anointed one referred to Jesus here. And I'll show you why when we get there, okay? From the issuing of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one, a prince, arrives, there will be a period of seven weeks or seven sevens and 62 sevens. Now, notice the grammar there, if you will, please, okay, because this is really important. And then he says, it will again be built with plaza and moat, but in distressful times. What's going to get rebuilt? Jerusalem. During distressful times, but at Jerusalem. But I want you to look at the grammar, because this is a really, really interesting thing. Here's the actual grammar from the Masoretic text, which was the original text. Notice that I put in red. The top one says there will be a period of seven weeks and 62 weeks. In the original Masoretic text, there was a hard break after seven weeks, seven sevens. So there will be an anointed one, a prince, and there shall be seven sevens, 49 years, period. The anointed one shows up after 49 years. That's the original Masoretic text. Then... For 62 weeks, it shall be built again. And notice that we have a different segment of the 490 years. Are you following what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. 
we read this up here that there will be 49. And so there'll be seven weeks plus 62. That would be 69. And you've heard this in people's teaching. There'll be 69 weeks of years. Okay. That's 483 weeks. And then there'll be a big break until the last seven weeks of the 490, which will be the Great Tribulation. And at the end of that 483 years, that, that prophesied Jesus the Messiah dying on the cross. If you follow the original text from the Hebrew, the anointed one cannot be the Messiah because the anointed one shows up after 49 weeks. The 62 weeks refer to the, what's happening in Jerusalem not re don't refer to the coming of an anointed one. Now watch what happens in the, the, the NAT version of the Bible. And this is from their translator notes. So TN is translator notes. SN is study notes. The accents in the Masoretic text, that's the MT, indicate disjunction, a break at this point, which would make it difficult, if not impossible, to identify the anointed one prince of this verse as messianic. You can't identify this as Jesus if you follow the original markings in the text. The reference to the 62 weeks as a unit is the way it was originally written, not the way it's been translated. By the way, it wasn't until the fourth revision of the King James Bible that that Masoretic text was changed in terms of how it was translated. It was in the 1800s where that started, people looked at that and said, well, let's make it 62 plus the others, you know, the seven plus the 62. So this, this changing of, of the grammar here is a recent, it's not, it's not original by any means. So with that alone, we have to take Jesus out of the equation in terms of the messianic part of this. So he goes on. Now here's the second segment. Now, after the 62 weeks, which fits with the grammar, if you follow it, because he doesn't say now after the 49 plus, you know, 62, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one, another reference, not the same person, will be cut off and have nothing. This is where most Bible teachers will say the anointed one here is Jesus, and they will go to great length to show you the, the, the chron chronology that says the anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. That's crucifixion. As for the city and the sanctuary, the people of the coming prince will destroy them. Well, who's the coming prince? Is, the, is it the anointed one or is it somebody different? Well, we have two different people here. The, the people of the coming prince will destroy them, but his end will come speedily like a flood. Until the end of the war that has been decreed, there will be destruction. Was that true around the crucifixion of Jesus? Not really. So what we do is we have this break where we have to jump now to the last seven years, and we have this coming prince is coming during the Great Tribulation, whenever that's going to be somewhere out in the future. That's how we parse this if we're going to be premillennial. You see why this gets to be kind of cumbersome here? So he, 27, the prince who is to come, will, concern, will confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's for seven years. But in the middle of that, that seven years, sevens, he will bring sacrifices and offerings to a halt, but on the wing of the abominations will come one who destroys until the decreed end is poured out on the one who destroys. And we have taken that in a premillennial pre-tribulation and said, the covenant is the Antichrist making a covenant with someone for seven years, and at the three and a half year period of time, he breaks the covenant and defiles the temple, and then all hell breaks loose. That's how we've come to interpret that. But from a clear reading, it doesn't fit Daniel 9. Last week, we talked about a preterist view. A preterist view says most prophecies have already been fulfilled. They're not yet future, especially ones dealing with Israel, unless you hold the fact that God separates Israel out and has something special for them yet to come. So with that in mind, here we go. Three primary views of Daniel 9. It's the end of captivity and restoration, and Jerusalem's rebuilt. That's what Daniel 9 is about. Gabriel's telling Daniel, this is the end of captivity, restoration is going to happen, Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. But Daniel was asking about 70 years, and Gabriel says in his vision, no, it's not 70 now, it's 490. 
say so that becomes an issue now. So don't you think Daniel has this big question mark up coming out of his head? Like, wait a second. I, I thought the 70 were up. I had some hope I'm going back and we're getting, a, no, he, Gabriel says, no, it's longer than that. It's not just 70. Secondly, it's a prediction of Messiah's crucifixion and suffering. This is sometimes the way it's viewed. And if you're premillennial, pre-tribulational, this is the prediction of Messiah's crucifixion and suffering. And you overlay that into Daniel 9, Gabriel's interpretation of understanding for Daniel. The third way, it's a postponement of restoration. So the postponement of restoration would be, Daniel, there's a 70 that God promised, and they'll probably, there'll be people going back. But there's not real spiritual restoration. There's people returning without restoration. The restoration is not going to happen for another 490 years. Okay, so, so if that's the if that's the calendar, then we have to take a look at whether that calendar actually fits or not. So as we look at Daniel nine, what's the date of Daniel nine too? Well, the 605 BC is the word of Jeremiah. From the word of Jeremiah about the prophecy of 70 years happening. And I will show you that happened around 605 BC. So that's one of the keys we have to look at. Then we got to look at the prayer of Daniel. The whole key to the prayer of Daniel is that Daniel is confessing, we screwed it up. We broke it all. I mean, Daniel spends all those verses saying, we are so bad. I mean, we're terrible. And the reality is the people living in Babylon had not turned back to God. There were a few like Daniel. But the majority were still spiritual agnostics. They had adopted the Babylonian religion. So for spiritual restoration, they weren't ready to now follow God's laws and God's covenants. And then we've got this separation of the text in, in 25 that it breaks it into three, three different units. 490 years have three separate components. 49, 434, and 7, and they're broken into three, and Gabriel makes it very clear, there's three segments here, it's not just one, one segment, and then you've got what's the meaning of the 70 weeks, and then Gabriel adds another 7 to mul as a multiplier, so Gabriel says, I'm going to add the Sabbath 7, and it's 490 years, and then you've got the literal fulfillment, so I want to show you the literal fulfillment of these 70 weeks, or 77s of 490 years, what's the chronology of that? So here, here's the actual dates from history of the three deportations into Babylon. Daniel was part of the first deportation in 605 BC. So Babylon comes, they take all, they destroy the temple, they take all the temple furniture, they take all the temple stuff, the, the, all the, the decorations, they take that all to Babylon. Seven years later, the people that were left in Judah in Jerusalem ticked off the king of Babylon, and he came and took another deportation. This was the second one. It happened in 497, or 597. Twelve years after that, there was a third deportation because Jeconiah, the king, screwed up again. And Babylon said, I got to put my fist down, and they come in 586 and take another group. And so if you start looking at those dates, 605, 597, and 586, if you take the 70 years out of that, it gives you the dates of potentially when this restoration of the 70 years of Jeremiah should have been up. Are you following how I'm getting the 70 years from Jeremiah here? We're not doing Gabriel's 490. We're doing Jeremiah's 70. So Daniel's down here, right? And he's about writing here now, and he's realizing it's time. The 70 years are probably up. And then Gabriel comes and throws all this 490 year stuff at him. But I just want to ask you, if we take all the years, just take the 490 years of Gabriel's prophecy, Gabriel's promise. This is what God has in mind. With any of these dates starting here, look at, the, look at these dates. With any of these dates, do you get Jesus dying on the cross 490 years? So subtract 490 years from the closest date to, to Jesus being on the planet. We're not even close yet. We're hundred years, almost a hundred years off with the closest date. Yeah. You subtract 490 from that. You still don't get Jesus dying on the cross. I don't care which deportation you take. You can't do the chronology where Gabriel's talking about Jesus, the Messiah coming and being cut off. 
it doesn't fit doesn't fit the timeline it's just not there and so what you have to do to make that 490 work is you've got to say well that's coming from somewhere else in here so what you figure out is let's go to ad 25 where jesus was probably crucified because he was born in ad 4 or 6 and then you start adding backwards until you come to that number of 490 you know and then you pick that date as this but that's not what daniel says it doesn't fit the timeline so as you come back into this, let's talk about the anointed one in Daniel. As early as the time of Isaiah, God had revealed the coming of a Messiah who would be instrumental in releasing his people from the predicted exile in Babylon. That Messiah in Isaiah 45 is Cyrus, who is referred to in Daniel as Darius, same person, different, different uh, ethnic word as the king. Look at 45.1, thus says Yahweh to his anointed one. Same exact words in the Hebrew. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subjugate nations before him, and I uncover the loins of kings to open doors, and gates shall not be shut. Go talk to Nanny. When Jeremiah prophesied the 70 years, God had already told Isaiah that Cyrus was the Messiah that was going to send Judah back after the 70 years. So the time frame of 70 from Jeremiah still fits, and it, but it doesn't fit Jesus. It fits Cyrus, who was the Messiah or the anointed one. So Cyrus comes into this thing, and he's reading about the restoration, and, and Jeremiah is clear. There's 70 actual years, and Daniel wants to know about those, and here's what happened. And I'll show you that timeline in just a minute here. Cyrus came in and took over the Babylon, took over Babylon, became the king of the empire plus Babylon, and he, he sent out and said, it's time where Judah can go back. In fact, all the nations can return to their homeland. But the 70 years ended not in spiritual restoration. They ended in return. Gabriel comes to Daniel and says, spiritual restoration of, of Judah is not going to happen for 490 years. So there were some people that went back. And after they had been, in, been there for about 10 to 12 years, Nehemiah went back to help them rebuild it and get the temple rebuilt, and that all happened in that time frame. 70 years prophecy by Jeremiah was fulfilled by Cyrus, who, who released any captive in Babylon to return, not just Judah, anybody. Whatever nation you're from, if you want to go home, you can go home. But God's telling Daniel, there's not going to be spiritual restoration, there's just going to be return. Okay, are you tracking what the two time frames are here? So, <laughs> Look at the time frames. Jeremiah's word goes out in Jeremiah 25 and 29 in 605 BC. And Gabriel says there's going to be a period of 49 years. That's the seven sevens. And at the end of that 49 years, a Messiah is going to appear. That Messiah was Cyrus. And in 556, actually to the date of 49 years, he takes over the Babylonian Empire, and in 539, at the end of the 70-year period, in that time frame, he tells everybody you can go home. If you left Judah in 605, 70 years after you were taken in that first deportation, Cyrus released you to go back. Anybody that was in Babylon, any that lived anywhere in Babylon, the whole empire could return to Judah because of Cyrus's decree. And that's the 49 years to the date when Cyrus took over Babylonian empire. Now you go from 556 to 539, 538 in that realm where he actually takes over the, the city of Babylon and releases everybody. And this is right here where we're at in Daniel 9, where this red arrow is, is Daniel 9. Daniel's coming to the realization the 70 years are up. Okay, now, Gabriel comes in at this period of time, and G Gabriel comes he here, right, right here. This is where we are. And Gabriel comes and says, okay, this was the 49 years. That was past. That's history. That's looking back. This has already happened. It's not going to happen again. This has already happened. Cyrus was the Messiah. God appointed him. Isaiah confirms it. Now, he says to Daniel, there's going to be 62 sevens of distressful times for Judah and Jerusalem and the whole empire down there. 
And that's 430 years of basically crap for that part of the world. Well, is that true? Yes. The temple was rebuilt, and I have it right here, about 515 BC, right here. The second temple. Solomon's temple was the first one. This was the second temple. The temple that, that Jesus walked in was Herod's temple, not the second temple. So we have the second temple built, but look what happens. So the Persians are running the show all the way up through here. This is all Persian right here. Persian rule. Guess who comes along about 320s, 325, 323 BC? Alexander the Great. He overthrows the entire empire, and Israel and Judah are sitting right in the middle. They're in the heart of it. They're in the cross. They're, they are, the armies are running back and forth through them. Everything's getting torn up because they're fighting. Uh, Alexander the Great dies, and his empire is broken into four of his generals. And one of the generals, the Seleucid general, takes over all of Judah and Israel. And they are under the thumb of the Greeks. And that's why we have Greek as the language of the New Testament, because during this period of time, right through this period of time, right here, this is all Greek. The Hellenistic influence in, is, so what they came in, they came in, they destroyed, you can't worship, the temple's still there, but it wasn't functioning. It was just, I mean, it was, it was messed up time for, for Judah, even though they'd gone back. And Gabriel says for 434 years, it's going to be messed up. So interesting things here, right about 164 BC, somebody comes in to, to prominence by a man named uh, Joseph Maccabeus, the Maccabeans. And the Maccabeans start fighting against the Greeks. And the Maccabeans are Jewish. They're Jewish patriots. And they start trying to overthrow because they want Judah and Israel back as a separate patriotic land ruled by themselves, ruled by Jews. No Jews are ruling this yet, okay? So right in here, about 164, they come through and they start doing all this fighting against the Greeks. But this guy right here, in 104, 103 BC, Judah declares their independence. 434 years of fighting and distressful times. And at the end of that period of time, Judah has a larger land mass of their empire or their country than they've ever had. He expanded the boundaries. He blew this thing off. I mean, he basically took over and restored Judah and Israel to their solemn, Solomon kind of realm. This was huge. This was the promise of relief right here. So he, he's killed by his brother. And for a period of time, and I'm, I'm going I'm to give you the history in just a minute. For a period of time after he's killed, his brother comes in during this period of time here, during this seven years, if you'll see it down through here, there's 94 to, to 88 BC, his brother takes over and all hell breaks loose. Now, let me, let me go forward with this here and uh, let me clear the drawings out here. All right, so... Let me get through. I want to see if I, I thought I had his brother in here. So let me finish the history here. So his brother takes over and his brother declares himself king and high priest both. And during this seven years, about the middle of that seven year period of time, remember Gabriel said in that seven year period, there's going to be a problem in the middle of the time frame. About in the middle of that time, remember, he's the high priest here and he's also the king. So he's in the temple. <laughs> this, this is so, I mean, this is, this is so stupid. You can't even, I mean, how can a person be this stupid? So during this period of time, he's in the temple and he's doing sacrifice. And instead of pouring the libation sacrifice out on the altar, he gets ticked off at the people that are there and he pours it out on his own feet. Now you can imagine the people that are in the temple wanting to worship and watch the whole Jewish sequence of sacrifice, 
He desecrates the whole process. He pours it out on his own feet. As though basically saying to everybody, up yours. Everybody in the temple throws a, a hissy fit. He calls in his army and he kills 6,000 people in the temple. It's like, oh my goodness. And that's halfway through. Before this seven year period of, of time is over, this seven years right here, 50,000 Jews are dead by their own king and priest. 6,000 just in the temple. And then before that seven years is up, 50,000 are dead. And what he does is he goes and makes a covenant with a Greek army, Greek mercenaries. And when Gabriel talks about a covenant, that could have been what he's referring to. And he hires these Greek mercenaries and they come in and just start killing people. This is, these are his own people. Well, lo and behold, he's killed by you know one of his sons because they've had enough of it. And then basically Rome takes over. Do what? Who was that that, that did all that? Well, Alexander Janias right here is the guy's name. Oh, okay. Okay. This is the, this is the guy that was leading that. And then right about here now, Rome comes into the picture, okay? Because this is, I mean, the Middle East is a bad, it's, it's just a mess. Rome comes in, starts taking over the world, and they come in, and now all of a sudden, this is it. Rome takes over. In 64 BC, this is all Rome. By the way, the Herod the Great that lived during the time of Jesus was one of the great-great-grandchildren of this guy up here. Two. Herod the Great was from that line. Okay, so that gets you now. Then you see the temples destroyed. What in AD seventy? And the Jesus talks about in Matthew twenty four. So when we're talking now about this happening here, the four hundred thirty four years, the seven years, they all fit historically right into the sequencing here. You don't have to arbitrarily throw them out into the future. And you don't have to say there's some big gap in here of unreckoned time, because what, what Gabriel told, told Daniel focused on the whole restoration of Israel. After the 490 years were up, they still broke the covenant. They still didn't repent. God gave them an additional 490 years to get it right. The whole land was reclaimed and everything looked great, and they still screwed it up. But you can't force Jesus the Messiah into Daniel 9. He just doesn't fit anywhere in the timeline. So you got the sevens down here in 7, 62, and 1. Here's the years. But they're uniquely Jewish history. Most of us as Christians in the, in the United States, they have no clue what happened in the history of Israel. And during that period between you know 200 years before Jesus was born, we have no clue what was going on. We don't even think about the Maccabees and, and what was going on and who ruled what and how Greek was taken over by Rome and what happened in Israel. That's, that's history that's unknown to us. We don't even think about it. But when you look at this here, this is all Jewish history, and it comes straight from Daniel 9. But see, as Gentiles, we don't, we don't look at study Jewish history. We don't know what's going on with that. So when we're looking at this, now we come to this. And here was the assumption that Daniel 9 talked about the seven years of great tribulation so is great tribulation a biblical concept that's my question to you and the answer is yes it shows up in daniel 12 it shows up in revelation 7 it shows up in matthew 24 here's daniel 12 not 9 12 and there shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation till that time and he talks about this great time of trouble here's revelation 7 John's revealed the ones are coming out of the great tribulation. John sees these people clothed in white robes and in the, the heaven scene. And, and he says, where'd they come from? And the angel says they came out of the great tribulation. Well, what is that? Matthew, Jesus talking. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken about by the prophet Daniel. Well, that's in Daniel 12, not nine. Let those who are in Judea flee, and he's talking here, and we'll look at this at some point if you want to, but he's talking here about what happens in AD 70 in, in Jerusalem. Then he says in 21, for there will be a great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be, and if those days had not been cut short, no human would be saved for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So is great tribulation a biblical concept? Yes. 
here's the problem. When you go through this, there's a reality of a great tribulation. It's always connected to the end. It occurs prior to Jesus' return. It's linked in what I just showed you in Daniel 12 and 7 and 24. But there's no record anywhere in the Bible of a seven-year time frame or literally any time frame. I mean, I can take you on a word study of the New Testament or in the Old Testament book. There is never any time frame given to great tribulation. Its duration cannot be determined. So if I don't have a great tribulation of seven years that something happens halfway through, what does that mean? And how do I, you know, how do I begin to, to wrestle with that? Well, the tribulation, the great tribulation is focused on the persecution of believers, regardless of ethnicity, Jew or Gentile. And it's a pressure to compromise faith in Jesus. It's always that pressure to compromise faith. And it's always this. It seems to present an already has happened, but is still more to come. Uh, and, and I can take you through as we look, because I think it's worthwhile looking at what does, what does tribulation mean? What does great tribulation mean? What is the sequencing? We know there's no time frame to it. There's no seven years that I can prove biblically. But is tribulation different for, for everybody? Is great tribulation different? Are there people in the world right now that are going through great tribulation? Oh, yeah. It's the persecution of believers and pressure to compromise their faith in Jesus. Are there people right now that are facing life and death, prison, starvation because of their faith in Jesus? There are people yes. in the world that are facing that right now. Yes. yes. Would they say, would you say they're in great tribulation right now? I would say yes. Jesus said, don't, don't worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough trouble for itself, right? So we know tribulation is a normal experience. When we talk about great tribulation, what does that mean? And is it an already here, but still yet to come kind of sequence? I will tell you that I believe great tribulation will precede the return of Jesus. I don't believe it's going to be, I don't believe that I can give you a duration of it. It could be 20 years. It could be six months. We don't know biblically how long that will be. But to take Daniel 9 and to overlay it and come to the conclusion that this is what it means, it doesn't fit biblically. You can't support that biblically. So for me, Daniel 9 is Jewish history that's already been completed. Okay. Okay. There's other parts in Daniel that talk about tribulation and other things that, that talk about kingdoms to come and that kind of stuff. But for the most part, I don't base my great tribulation theories around a seven-year period of time based in Daniel because I can't, I can't support it biblically. Okay, so what questions does this raise for you then? Dave, your head's looking like it's going to explode here. <laughs> I'm struggling to justify in my mind the tribulation pre-Jesus. So when the Old Testament talks in multiple places about, about troubled times for Israel and all that kind of stuff, you don't see you don't see Israel as being in tribulation. Well, I always felt the tribulation was the end of time, the second coming. And now it's, you're telling me it's not. No, I'm telling you it's both and. I, 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 I think I can support biblically that it's both and. And so what you have to do is look at the context of where that's coming from. When Jesus talks about a great tribulation, he's talking about a both and in that context as well in Matthew 24, because the great tribulation that was coming for the Jews, the ethnic Jews in Jerusalem, was when Rome came in and killed everybody and destroyed the whole thing. And he says, hey, flee. If you can get out, get out. But he says, woe to those who are pregnant and can't run and all this kind of stuff. And he says, it's going to be a time like you've never experienced before. I, I, would you not agree with, I mean, I think we can all agree there have been times of, of tribulation that every generation would, would have said this was great tribulation. I've never seen it like this before. 
Yeah. I've never seen the times like this before. Our parents said that. I think our grandparents said that. When the Great Depression came, you know, I told somebody the other day, my dad never wore jeans after the Great the, the Great Depression because he had to wear them during the Great Depression. He vowed he would never wear them. He never wore jeans his entire adult life because of that. So the, the siding of saying Great Tribulation is limited just to one future event, that's where, that's where I think we, we have to, to be careful we don't get into because that becomes a real issue. Greg, we, has, we, Greg, hasn't there been tribulation since the garden? Tribulation since when? Since, since the garden. Adam and Eve. I mean, there, there has always been tribulation in the world, hasn't there? Yeah, but the, the, the point of, of how do you define that versus great tribulation? That's the issue. Well, you know what I, what I think? Uh, I, you know, can the word great be relative? I mean, something may, there may be tribulation going on, uh, and it's great to me, but maybe not to you. Well, that's the difference between major and minor surgery, right? Major is when it's on me and minor is when it's on you. And yeah. that's, I think that's the feel of what great tribulation is. But there's, there's a phrase that Jesus used and then John the Apostle used in the book of Revelation, and he defined it as great. And it's to distinguish it from not great. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there is a period of time. But my point to you is we're not given the, what the period of time is. Yeah. His ways are not our ways. Well, true. But the problem is we've come to believe that, you know, this is an issue where we can kind of get a time frame around it. Then we build a system around that, those seven years. And then so we start looking for indications in Israel, like the rebuilding of a temple and you know that kind of stuff and as a result i think sometimes we focus on things that are probably not accurate i would agree with that all right what other questions does it raise for you so greg um is there an issue with calling the great tribulation that which is defined in Re Revelation 6 through 19 and not give it a time frame? But just say, truly, what is described in those chapters sounds worse than anything we've ever seen or will ever see. Um. The, the problem with that, Kent, is when you look at that, you've got to determine, am I basing that on around a seven-year time frame and looking for a right. sequence? No, no, no. I'm not taking it at face value. Yeah, I'm not limiting its time frame. I'm just saying that, the, that what is de described in those chapters seems pretty great, pretty... Uh, as as bad as anything that can possibly ever be. Well, at least from our experience in the United States, it's worse than anything we've experienced. You know, I'm not sure that the people that are living in certain countries in Africa that have had their arms cut off and, you know, again, yeah. there's, there's a contextual issue here. Right, 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 right. And so... I'm almost of the opinion there are certain people around the world today that are experiencing, in quotes, their great tribulation now. That's kind of what I was trying to trying to say. But there's coming a time yet in the future where there's going to be a period of time prior to the return of Jesus where it's going to get a lot worse, worse than the, the world has ever seen. That's what you're talking about, Kent. What's described That's, there is right. worse than the world has ever seen. And there, that period of time is coming. I just can't tell you it's seven years. Right. Agreed. Agreed. And I think the problem with using that term is that people will naturally fall back to that seven year assumption. Um, so yeah. because yeah. we associate great tribulation with a time frame. Exactly. Exactly. And the only Agreed. time frame we're given biblically is Jesus said it's going to be it's going to be long enough, but it's going to be shortened because if I didn't shorten it, no one would survive. Right. 
Right. Yeah. Okay. That's the only time frame we're given. It's going to be long enough to hurt, but it's not going to be so long that it's going to kill everybody. I mean, there's going to be some, Jesus said he's going to cut it short at some point. That's where, that's what we struggle with. That's the, the issue. So, you know, we're taking this system and, you know, we, we go back and try and build this system here in terms of, you know, what does this look like? And when, when you go back and try and build the system, you know, it's locked into particular time frames here. And these time frames, you know, this seven year period of time, and we take that directly from Daniel nine, that's the only place we get it. There's no other reference that we can ever get that from. And so if I take Daniel nine, then that doesn't fit. That's gone. So, you know, if I take the fact, if I take this period out here, and I really take the new covenant, which is, you know, coming here, and God, th these covenants were all broken, and God put a new covenant right here in, that he put in place, this new covenant, then I'm, you know, I'm just flowing through life until I get to the point where Jesus says it's time to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to catch those believers who are alive in the air. Those who are dead are going to be resurrected. The earth, the unbelievers will be resurrected to judgment. And then we're going to come, you know, into the end. But this period of time right here, which we have known as a literal thousand year reign of Christ on the planet, seems to me to be an assumption that is pretty hard to prove. Where did that period of time for the scholars come from? This period of time came in, in the early 1900s. I mean, what? where did they get this, this notion? They got it from, from Daniel 9. Remember when we talked about the whole grammar being changed in Daniel 9, where all of a sudden the 62 years were not a separate segment but they were tied. And so we had these 483 years of what was going on at the end of 483 years, Jesus died. And then that seventh year was, was broken and put somewhere out in the future. But it never came. I never heard the, the thousand. The, the, mentioned. I, and I'll take you on a study of the millennium if you want and show you what we know scripturally, but what they make it to come out to you. Can, I can't force all right, so tell me who gets into the millennium. Jesus comes back here, guys, everybody. Jesus comes back right here. Okay? Okay. Who gets into the who's left and who gets into the millennial period? Who gets in that? How do we get how do you get in that? And at the end of the millennial period, there's people that rebel and have to be quashed again. Where do they come from? How do so do we have believers and unbelievers both? I thought all believers were taken to heaven. So who populates that? See, that's where this stuff gets really weird, Dave, because now we got to come up with, so now I take obscure scriptures like Isaiah, the, the lamb will lay down with the wolf. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's most likely figurative, but now I've got to make it literal. And oh, by the way, that's described in the millennial kingdom because it'll be peace. Well, how can it be peace if people are rebel against God and there's, People that are rebellious that are still what ha, how are people born? What happens to them? Does Jesus come back? Jesus is already here. Does he come back again? And what happens to believers? What happens to unbelievers? We see that's it gets just frenetic to try and support what's going on during that thousand year reign. The Bible talks about a millennial thousand year. It happens in Revelation. The the question is, is that a literal or is that figurative? That's the that and that's the question that we have to at some point. Now, when we go to that passage, if we take out the assumptions and just take the passage at face value, we may come to different conclusions as we just read it for face value. That's my point. As we're looking at this, we're looking at it more, we're looking at standalones rather than forcing it into a system. I have no problem taking the millennial and let's talk about it, but let's talk about it over here without having to insert it in a system. So what can we know about the millennium? You know, it's like when we did that series on heaven, the Bible does tell us a lot about heaven, but there's a lot it doesn't tell us. So let's take what it tells us and know it, but let's assume there's a lot of stuff we don't know about it. And the same thing, the millennia is so sketchy in terms of what we know about it that we've now forced in this system all kinds of things into it. 
For example, here's one of the things that we force into this. You know what you and I as Christians are going to be doing in this millennial kingdom? We're going to be reigning with Christ. What the crap does that mean? Well, it's got to be better than not. Well, I know, but I'm saying, I mean, yeah, you know, what do you, you got Moldova, Dave? And uh, I'll take you. No, I don't want Ukraine. We'll give that to Al and Coke. They can have Ukraine. I'm, I mean, what we don't see, we don't know what that means. Is it, isn't that where we just we have to just trust? I mean, if we don't know, we trust. Okay, but is that what Daniel did though, Ted? Daniel didn't know. What did he do? Did he trust? He prayed for what? Understanding. Understanding, yeah. So to me, that's the step is you pray for understanding. It's not just a blind trust because, you know, that gets us into this thing where, you know, we're, we're just kind of there. Who do you trust is the question. So I think it's it's this issue for each of us. We pray for understanding. Okay, so God, there's a lot of this I don't understand. Oh, I yeah, yeah. I mean, help me understand it because there's certain things that I need to know and certain things I need to be aware of. And for me personally, if I am convinced in my heart that there is no seven year measure of a great tribulation, I'm not looking for certain signposts of when it starts. You see what I'm saying? And I got a lot of a lot of Christians I know that are still look, they scour the news every day looking for the sign. What oh, has it started? Is that the Antichrist? You know, who, who, are we in it yet? Well, I think people all through every generation have thought they were in it. So that to me, well, what I, if, what I'm if just trying to be a little more accurate there. Greg, what if what if God doesn't want and never intends for us to know that? Well, he's given us everything that he wants us to know biblically. So if I study the scriptures, I can know what I need to know. Yeah. We're not looking, you know, for stuff that's outside of that. But I believe he's been very clear in the scriptures about what he said. When I look at Daniel 9 and look at the time frame of the history of Israel, I don't have any question in my mind that that's what Gabriel was talking about. It fits chronology, and I cannot force Jesus in there no matter how I twist it. He doesn't fit in the chronology. The history doesn't work. So then I've got to take that out of the equation and say, well, it's got to be something. Gabriel wasn't referring to Jesus. He was referring to somebody else. But didn't you, you draw the, you, you drew the Jewish history from outside of the Bible? Well, the time the that time was, frames are there, both both inside and outside. Well, no, I that, but, but, but it's not re reference to biblical. It's reference. You're, you're you're taking the history that we have. That's Jewish history, which I'm not questioning. Right. But the Bible's not referring to that. Well, the you're, Old Testament is Jewish history. <laughs> Right, it, and, so and this, Daniel was, was this in, Daniel was written so during Second Temple times in the, in the Old Testament. Is that yeah? So I'm missing for for me, truth from any source is truth. So if I have historians dating something, yeah, it's still true. It doesn't I have understand. to be in the Bible to be true. So you know the support. You're right. The support is extra biblical in terms of the chronologies. And I'm just saying, for me, it fits the time frame, and I can't see Jesus fitting in that in the time frame from what Gabriel gave to, to Daniel. Right. And again, these are assumptions. If you have the assumption and you want to run with the assumption, I'm fine with it. But I just want you to open your mind to the fact that not everybody's going to agree with that assumption. And so other people may look at this instead of looking down at them and saying, well, you're wrong, or I don't get it. At least we have an opportunity to look and say, Okay, I can see where your assumption has fit in here, and this is my assumption. And yeah. as long as we support our assumption as, as much as we can biblically, we go with it. Right. I'm just trying to tweak your brain a little bit to say some of the stuff we've come to understand and not really looked at may not be as clear cut as we thought it was. That's the only thing I want to accomplish. This may not be as obvious as we thought it once was. So. <laughs> Back to the Great Tribulation. Years ago, when you had I don't done want to go back to the Great Tribulation. 
<laughs> you had done a study years ago on Revelation and you had talked about basically what you said before that it'll be relative, like it's kind of like surgery, you know, major or minor. And you had said originally that everything was centered in the Middle East and it would kind of spiral out to the other nations. So and that's, instance, that's based on the assumption that Israel is the central part. So do you still feel that way? I do not feel that Israel is a central part of the Great Tribulation. I think, I, I think Great Tribulation is focused on believers. If they're ethnic Jews that are believers, I'm fine with it. They'll be a part of it. Now, so that would be affected way more than your previous thoughts. I think people are going to be affected differently during Great Tribulation. You know, if, if I'm living in Costa Rica, I probably will not feel the same effects as if I'm living in Germany or Ukraine. Okay. So geographic proximity, I think, is going to have a lot to do with it. So it's but still going to be centralized in the Middle East. That seems to be the crossroads for a lot of what happens in history. Okay. Whether Israel is central or not, you got to get across that somehow. It seems to be the pathway that most people go through. Right. So we're not going to feel certain things that Iraq and Iran will feel. Okay. Maybe yes, maybe no. And no, maybe, I want to it, know. Maybe I don't know. it may be a different time frame. They may feel it at a different time than we do. That's the other side of it. If it's not yeah. a seven-year period, is it not possible that Ukraine could be going through a great tribulation period right now? And if you were in, living in Ukraine right now, you'd say, hey, this is as bad as I've ever seen it. That's true. So what we're looking at, though, biblically, is that that time frame before Jesus returns. That's what Revelation talks about. Right. And Jesus mentions that in, in Matthew 24 as well. All right. What else? All right, so what do you what do you want to know? What what do you want to think about? What do we look at? What's still out there you want to talk about? Just a comment. Um, over these last two weeks, I think it gives me a greater sense of peace, not knowing. Does that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I totally believe that. If you just think about it logically, could everyone at the exact same time go through the same great tribulation? I think everybody's going to be, it's going to be different from people in different times. But the fact that there isn't that hard uh, in stone, like you said, guidepost that says, okay, it's going to start right now. That gives me great peace that we have to trust in, in, in God. And, and like you said, keep asking, like I said last, but keep asking him to remove the scales from our eyes and, Yep. Teach, us, teach us what he wants us to know, but we just got to understand we're not as smart as he is. And, and the big thing, Al, is that the great hope of the church of a Christian has always been the return of Jesus, not the rapture. Absolutely. So so if I know there, there's not a seven-year period of time, and I, and I find out, oh, crap, it's day 10 of the Great Tribulation. It's like, well, crap, there's almost seven years to go. Mm-hmm. Versus now, I would say, there may be six months to go. That's my prayer. That's my hope. Come Lord Jesus, right? I mean, isn't that? So I'm not locked into this time frame that once it starts, now I got to wait it out. But the, the reality is it may be longer. We don't know. And it, But the sequence is, I don't put my trust in a timeline. I put my trust in the return of Jesus. Yep, absolutely. And we could all give stories of the tribulation we've gone through in our life. Every single one of us times when it got really dark times when it, I mean, and if you think of the worst times in your life, your personal great tribulation, I mean, we've all had those experiences in our, in our life. I mean, you know, I've, my, my dad died, my sister died. I mean, those were dark days for me. You've had those, you got all of us. What did we hold on to during that period of time? Yeah. It was a lot of this phrase, right? This too shall end. There's going to come an end to it. And that's the promise of scripture. 
no matter how great the tribulation is, the end is Jesus coming. And that's what that's where the hope is. That's where that's what we look at. And so to some degree, Al, you're right. It should give us a sense of relief that, you know, we're not stuck in a time frame. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Yes. In light of these two assumptions, would you like to look at Matthew 24 and what Jesus said about his return? Yes. Is that something you would like to, to, to see as we go with take the assumptions out of it and just look at it at face value? What is Jesus actually saying in Matthew 24 about his return? I mean, that's where he, that's where he gives the great tribulation concepts in Matthew 24. Is that something you would like to look at? I would. Yes. Yes. All right. So let's plan on looking at that next week. We'll look at Matthew 24 to get a chance to read through it. And we'll look at it and we'll, we'll neuter the assumptions and just take it at face value and not try and throw it into a system. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. Hey, Greg. Yeah. Just want to thank you for helping us understand this. Well, I'm I'm not sure we understand it or or we're even close well, yet, but we're we're at least getting getting some of the worst parts out of the way. Just want to thank you for your time. Yeah, well, not a problem. We just appreciate your hard work and study, Greg. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's not not many of us on this thing are uh, as deep in a scholar as you are. So please understand, uh, most of us are as and this. Uh, site are not nearly as smart as you are so don't forget that it doesn't have to do with smarts it just has to do with the as you know knowing where to look uh, well it's also it's also the time spent studying and I, I know how much time it takes you and i just want you to know how sincerely we appreciate it yeah all right well well thank you for that i i will tell you that i i'm i'm working on a doc on someone else's doctoral thesis that they did the Old Testament research on Great Tribulation. I'll share some of that next week. I just came across it today in some of my research. So very seldom does a person do their, their dissertation on what the Old Testament says about the Great Tribulation. This guy did. Wow. And it's very interesting because it'll help you understand when we overlay Matthew 24 to understand who Jesus was talking to. Remember, when you're studying scripture, what did the original author say to the original audience? Yeah. Okay. That's what we're trying to determine take everything else out of that we're looking at what did paul say to the romans when he was writing to the romans what did the romans hear paul say and that means you have to understand the context of what they were listening to what did daniel say to the jews he was writing to what did jeremiah you see you got to say the original author's intent to the original audience and so understanding the concept of great tribulation out of the old testament second temple people that's who jesus was talking to and when you understand that context it'll help us get a little better handle on some of the surrounding pieces of it all right does that make sense yes okay all right i do this with most classes i didn't do it last week but give me one thing that stuck out to you tonight what was the one light bulb or oh crap moment <coughs> Well, I think this the, all had to do with the Jews. Sorry, Al. I was just going to say the, con the, the concrete sequential and the explanation of the years in Daniel was uh, was huge. Okay. Who else? The thousand no years. What the time frame is. Okay, for Rick, it was a thousand years. Who else? We, we don't have any idea of what God's time frame is with this. Yeah, the time frame. You know, we get stuck into a time frame and it's really not supported biblically. And the concept of tribulation, how it could be at different points for different people. Yeah, that, and if you think about that, it, Susie, that really makes sense, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. we all know people in different locations. We go, man, they're going through stuff I've never, I hope I never have to go through. Right, they're truly being tested. Exactly. And remember, tribulation is about compromising your faith that's the that's the principle of of what jesus talked about what's going to make you compromise your faith have you ever any of you read the polling this week when the people were asked the question 
if the United States was attacked like Ukraine, would you stay and fight or would you run? Have yeah. you read any of the polling on that and the difference between Democrat and Republican responses? No. <laughs> yeah. The Democrats are running like crazy on all the polling. <laughs> and the Republicans are the ones that say, says I'll stay and fight. And I, I looked at that and I thought, so as a Christian, what Christian, when, when tribula true tribulation comes and I, I'm, I'm asked to compromise my faith or die or go to jail, are going to run and compromise or what you're going to stand and fight? That, that's kind of going through my head and my heart as I'm thinking about this, because what would we do in that situation? Well, don't you think it's interesting, too, that Biden said today when he was reading uh, that I'm not making a political stance here, but when he was reading that he was going to pro uh, provide shotgun shells and ammunition to the people of the Ukraine. And, and at the same time, they want us to do away with all the guns. And yeah, we're going to ban guns here, but we'll we'll give them over there. Yeah. It's a strange world we live in. That's for sure. All right. Any other takeaways? Any other light bulb moments? All right. Good enough. Thanks. Appreciate Thanks. your input. And, Thank you, uh, Greg. We'll Thank check you. in. I'll send out links for next week. I'll uh, I'll post this up for those that couldn't get in tonight. All okay. right. Thank, Thank you, Greg. You. Thanks, everybody. Thank Good you. night. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Thanks, everybody. See you.